Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you're joining us from. And welcome to Service Automation and Orchestration, which is a webinar put together by WTA's Technology Advisory Board. I'm Robert Bell, Executive Director of the World Teleport Association. If you're not familiar with us, we basically spend our time doing two things. One is advocating for the interests of teleport operators, uh, both commercial and also in terms of operations and technology purchases, and also promoting excellence in those same areas because uh, we think that's the right pairing. We want to drive continued excellence for the benefit of customers of this industry, uh, as well as the partners in other fields. And we also want to stand up and uh, represent the voice of the teleport operator that is sometimes not heard as, as often as that of the satellite operator or the technology provider. This uh, webinar is based upon a report published in July called Service Automation and Orchestration for Teleport Operators. Um, and it was really exploring the issues of how automation and uh, orchestration are growing in network operations for both satellite carriers and teleport operators. And we explored in that report and we'll be exploring today um, the extent to which those, those companies have embraced automation and orchestration, the benefits that they've sought from them, the barriers and the challenges that they faced, as well as the opportunities it creates and what we think the future will hold. So thank you very much for joining us in this discussion. The Technology Advisory Board is something formed last year uh, and it was based on the rising challenges and opportunities that we at WTA saw uh, from OTT and 5G to IoT, Leo, Mio, I mean, it goes on and on, which really requires a deeper understanding of technology innovation on the part of our core members who are independent teleport operators. And so that Technology Advisory Board provides guidance on technology adv advances and smart buying options. Uh, the membership in that Technology Advisory Board is open to leaders and patron members of our association that develop, manufacture, and market technology solutions. And you'll find them listed over on the right side of your uh, your screen. It's a, a very interesting and diverse group uh, that is contributing a great deal to uh, members of our association. So for today, we're going to uh, do a brief introduction, which I'm in the middle of now, uh, offer you some key insights from that report, and then turn to a panel of experts to uh, both uh, have a discussion based upon some questions I have, but also to bring your questions into it. And I want to take a moment to thank uh, Kratos Defense and Security Solutions. They, it was funding from them that made possible both that report and this webinar. Um, they're a very dynamic company. Of course, they're very well known in the, in the military and defense space in the United States, but they're also a real driver of the virtualization revolution that's changing our industry. So thanks to Kratos for that support and for helping us prepare this content. And finally, I'd be remiss if I did not thank some other companies for uh, being industry leaders and patrons, or industry leaders, excuse me, of WTA, uh, who provide additional financial support to us that makes possible so many of our programs. They are Utelsat, Intelsat, Kratos, again, again, a very strong supporter of WTA, Liquid Intelligent Technologies, and SES. So some takeaways from this report, just, just highlights, uh, and of course you may access the entire report yourself on our website. Um, the first one is that of course automation and orchestration have been staples of terrestrial telecom literally for decades. Uh, and the satellite services business right now is in a race to catch up. And the good news is that we didn't even, we used to not even know that a race was taking place, as near as I could tell. Well, we seem to have gotten that, that memo and we're now working hard on it. The eventual goal is to really incorporate every aspect of service management into an orchestrated architecture, right? Just everything we do needs to be part of that orchestration. And if we do it right, we'll be reducing uh, process uh, costs, we'll be reducing the amount of time that things take, we'll be optimizing our effectiveness, and possibly leading to completely new business models based upon that automation. In the, in the near term, orchestration is already transforming the customer experience in very positive ways, uh, from faster response to even proactive response, response before the, an issue has uh, affected the customer's quality of service, as well as um, highly accurate and near real-time service metrics that let us just run the operation a whole lot better than we used to. An interesting um, side effect, if you will, and yet one of huge importance, is the fact that successful orchestration frees engineering talent from managing day-to-day -day problems 
so that they can focus on driving new revenues for the business. And that, that, that's pretty nuanced, if you will. And if you think about the effect of that on your business over a number of years, it can be truly profound. And finally, the challenges. Well, the number one challenge is the fact that we can't throw out all the old stuff and install new stuff. It just doesn't make sense from a cost or benefit standpoint. So we need to integrate legacy system, systems. And that comes, of course, with many challenges because they've all been upgraded using and sometimes proprietary technologies. Uh, a lot of wrinkles to iron out over the course of that integration. So that is our report uh, and I'll have some more information about that for you at the end of the webinar. But I want to introduce our, our pa panelists who I think will be, offer a very interesting discussion. We have Gint Atkin Atkinson who is Vice President for Network Strategy and Digital, Digital Architecture at SES. Christopher Boyd who's Senior Director of Product Management at Kratos Defense and Security Solutions. And Will Mudge who's Vice President of Engineering Operations at Speedcast and also a member of the World Teleport Association Board. And uh, we had a preliminary call on this last week, and I can tell you these gentlemen have got some very interesting insights to share. And let's get into this discussion. Um, my first question is really just for anybody in the panel who wants to, to give us a definition. What exactly are we talking about when we're talking about service automation and orchestration? I'll let you go, Will. Go ahead. <laughs> I was looking at it. You, you don't don't, don't, all, don't all start at once now, you know. <laughs> so, so in my mind, I think automation is when you have a process that you follow, right? You see the value does this, therefore you take these steps to correct it, right? That's that's something that you can automate. It's a step-by-step -step process. Orchestration is bringing multiple processes together, right? If you see this, then you need to do this process and this process and this process and potentially across disparate systems. So there are two different steps, right? Automation is the first step and orchestration is a much broader collaboration across the many environments. Thank you, that makes it really simple. So let's talk about, let's dive into this topic basically. Where in your opinion, and Will, why don't we just start with you since you were answering that last question. Where do you think that service automation and orchestration are make, can make their biggest contributions in teleport operations? Yeah, it's a, I think there's a, a couple more questions you're gonna ask later too. So I mean, I'll try not to, to go too far down the rabbit hole in some of these, but it comes down to the quality of our service and what our customers are expecting in my mind. When we look at the ability to automate and orchestrate across these systems, we bring a better level of service to our customers and it's what they expect these days. And it's almost, I think we used the term table stakes before for, for what's needed. When you look at availability figures for, for customers or you look at the types of services that they're looking for, it's a requirement in many cases to be able to have a lot of these things in place to be able to automatically ticket when you have a problem identified as well as go through some remediation steps to, uh, to to rectify those things, the orchestration that goes along with it. So in my mind, the biggest contribution is it helps improve the quality of our service. It helps improve that customer experience and improves our availability. And we provide a better service to our end customers, which when they're happy with that, ends up growing our markets because they want more of it. Okay. Um, Christopher, would you be kind enough to answer the same question? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, in tops, uh, adding to what Will had, had said, I, I think, you know, we have this automation um, that we've been working on from, you know, a framework of the past where we have IT system automation. We're, we're automating routine processes and, and um, you know, the things that people are going to click through on dashboards, configurations, and setups. Um, orchestration, as Will you know, sort of said, was is starting to stitch together automation pieces into chains. Um, we actually take it one level further. When you, when you add service orchestration, so the way it's written sort of is not together, but we look at it as when you take service orchestration, you then start to think about end-to-end -end services at, from a customer's perspective. How do I actually drive from the customer's endpoint to the service they want to connect to, whether it be the internet, whether it be a cloud service, um, obviously, Microsoft's done a tremendous job getting us all onto Microsoft 365. So there's a strong desire for folks to get connected to Azure Cloud for services. And so I think when you you know start to look at the future of orchestration, it's not only how do I connect the elements that bring together the satellite service and the teleport, but then how do I stitch together various accesses to the cloud, to the internet, et cetera. So I you know my view is really more of a broader service orchestration connection. Um, and those layer on the things that Will had alluded to, and I'm sure the thing Gint's going to add to as well, 
Um, but again, I think taking that, um, that, that perspective, and then of course those pieces distill down from a service orchestration into element orchestration and, and, and endpoint automation. Uh, so I see it more of a pyramid approach uh, you know, from, from that service point down to the elements. Now we're getting now we're getting down into the nitty gritty, but you raise an important point. Um, and, and again, I'd like you to think about this as you answer. Um, you know, we're in the teleport. We're not, not talking about satellite, I mean, just satellite, right? We're talking about a hybrid fiber satellite network in which we don't control, you know, all the endpoints. They don't run over our infrastructure. And yet, uh, as Christopher just said, you know, we've got, if you will, ultimately the responsibility for that end-to-end -end experience. So. Where do you see automation and orchestration making their biggest contributions? So I, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about where I see it. I'm gonna talk about where I saw it for the last 15 years. <laughs> okay. um, and, I, and I think this is a big problem. And, and also, I think it's also, it's, it's important we think about, are we talking about service in a teleport? Because if, if we think about our audience and we talk about the service is in a teleport because SES goes to a teleport and asks for a lot of things that still require hands. Now, if you wanna reduce how many times you go to your rack and touch the power and touch the rack and touch the baseband processor, and, and then, then you need to look at how the terrestrial mobile world has done that. So when when they start aggregating many base stations into a huge edge processing facility or a highly centralized data center you know what happens there so i think that's where we kind of go back to service automation and orchestration which services are we talking about some of the services uh, especially teleport service providers eventually we are asking you to do some very physical things. Um, if we want a farm of antennas and we want to share the farm of antennas, there's a whole bunch of ways we could do it. We could do it really manually and then we could start introducing automation and automate what was done manually. But still, I think let's not lose sight that there's a, a great deal of physical work um, that can get, quote, automated and orchestrated and orchestrated and if i if i go to even earlier on you know as william was saying first automation then orchestration but sometimes we do an exception i'll i'll do the exception the other way around later but ideally we virtualize because when we virtualize we start putting many different kinds of virtualized functions whether it's if whether it's baseband whether it's higher layer protocol stacks whether it's the control plane and we start putting them on shared hardware. And we can move that workload around to different places. We can fail over from one gateway to another gateway and spin up the workload of baseband processing at another location. Satellite repoints the beams and you know, within seconds or under a minute, we have a really nice clean failover after an entire maybe gateway was completely wiped out. But, um, don't forget there's still a lot of manual work that needs to be orchestrated and i'll give you a good example eventually we have people doing work it may be mechanical work or it may be inside applications they have two screens and they have to go from one screen and take vlan ids frequencies time slots carrier ids and put them into another application and another screen that process of moving from this app to the other app with a person in between can also be orchestrated. So a big thing about orchestration is we can automate the resources, i.e. the network. We can automate the infrastructure software. We can automate the services, and then we can automate, and especially we really need orchestration to do the mix of automation and bits and pieces of work that are left over for people to step in, monitor, or give it another push or make, make a decision. So really, you know, we need that automation and especially as 
we get up into the business process where we can't virtualize, we might not be able to automate, but the humans need a little bit of help to go faster, higher quality. This is also, orchestration is really valuable in that whole stack. <laughs> Nothing makes me feel like I'm doing less useful work than copying information from one one screen to another personally. So, which you know, we still do. The, the um, key thing is you got to make a decision. Probably, I know it's frustrating to be stuck between two apps, but yep, sometimes you got to use your. Sometimes you have to use that brain. You know, it's it's a it's really annoying. Um, let's just get specific here because that's you know we're we're right now we're sort of at the fifty five thousand foot level on this. Um, could you, and I guess I'll go back to Will, could you take us through a typical automation or orchestration project that you've been involved with? Um, so what was the challenge to be met? Uh, how did that, that automation or orchestration or combination of the two meet it? And what were the resulting benefits specifically? Do you have a story to tell us, Will? Oh, we have stories. Many of them horror <laughs> yeah. stories, but we have stories to tell for sure. I think when you look at, uh, for us, the challenge tends to be scale and sometimes, right? When you have a, a broad array of information that you're bringing in and then you need to analyze it and make a decision off of it and it put some kind of a process in place from it. You know, if we talk at basic levels, you know, looking at if a customer service is up and running, right? If we do that, all the information that we bring into a database, picking the database, setting the API so that the data goes into that database, and then setting up yet another software package to be able to read that information out of the database and make an intelligent decision to create a ticket and say, hey, look, your customer's down. You need to go look at this, this service. Now, many of us have been through that already, right? So I don't think it's, it's unique in the way it is, but it's a pretty critical automation to the things that we do because it's the first step, right? It's the gate to what actions do we take next? And I think that's kind of where Gent was going. I think... Um, as we continue to do it, where we see the biggest struggles is how do you bring in, and I think you said early on, that legacy equipment, right? Virtualizing the stack, 100% agree with you, Ben. I think that's actually, that's absolutely where we're going, but there's always devices that you can't virtualize. You can't virtualize an amplifier. You probably could virtualize an ACU, maybe not the outdoor ACU piece of it. Uh, you know, LMB, redundancy controllers, things like that. There's always pieces that you have to be able to pull into some kind of a structured database to be able to help drive some of those orchestration decisions so that you can make these things a bit more seamless. Hmm. Hmm. So when you did this, when you've done some of this particular work, what, you know, what are some of those specific benefits that come out of that? Because we've talked about obviously quality of service, right? That's probably the core one. Um, yeah. And I think what, about kind of costs, what about revenues? Well, both, right? They both tie into it, right? When a customer gets a better service, you increase your revenues because they're going to give you more business that comes out of it as well, um, as well as being able to offer a higher value service to them, right? Quality is really the focus for what we do when you look at those, those customer services, but the other two are a result of having that, that quality level. SES would go and, and commission a teleport service if they were going to get, you know, 85% availability. Right, they would commission a service where they get the highest availability, the highest value for their money. And I think ultimately that's what we talk about when we when we go through these things, right? If you automate, you can reduce your total cost basis for a teleport operation, which I think is a coming question. I'm trying to avoid going into it too deep. But you can you can reduce that cost basis and increase your quality, which in, results in improved revenues and new business opportunities. That's pretty well summed up. Um, Gant, what do you want to add to that? Or, or rather tell us, I guess, maybe from an SES story perspective about a typical automation slash orchestration project, <clears throat> challenges, you know, barriers, and, and, and uh, ultimately the resulting benefit. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the big areas is we really have to take a look at the, at the work that that is progressing with SAPCOM being virtualized and put into the cloud, which is much more of a CRAM style architecture. But we are so extremely far behind terrestrial radio access network architectures um, on the SATCOM side. You know, we we don't have the standardized uh, type of baseband processing, beam forming, beam shaping, 
access to um, all sorts of antenna technology that has benefited from mega, mega, massive scale. Just take take a look at the radio inside of your mesh net, your latest mesh network your Wi-Fi at home millimeter wave I mean it's it's staggering how cheap that hardware is take a look at the the latest release of the snapdragon and how it can do beam forming and beam shaping and you know why don't we have that going into our terminals so there's a huge amount of work to do Kratos is really driving a tremendous amount of critical parts of virtualization of the SATCOM network um, and working very closely with Microsoft to get that in the cloud. But after everyone goes to the cloud, we can see what's happening now, especially on the terrestrial side. Once you go to the cloud and you get the quick benefits and you know, you're sold on that cloud-based architecture, you still have a lot of problems that can't be solved with the centralized architecture back to the edge so now we're going to see you know when kratos does their work and we have more of the satcom industry following with virtualization we work with a cloud ran style pattern with everything going in the cloud get that working and then what we do is we do what, what everyone else is doing especially with 5g now we go back to the edge now isn't a teleport an exciting place to put an edge so i think this is one big thing for the industry is that you have an extraordinary opportunity to share resources and to put very special resources out at teleports where they belong. I think it's crystal clear. It's a place to put an edge. And once there's more of the RAN infrastructure virtualized, we're going to be able to run more of the SATCOM RAN at the teleport using that standardized virtualized infrastructure and you know companies like microsoft and azure they're going to be putting an edge platform out there in the case of microsoft they're going to put i, I suspect they're going to put azure orbital out there so i see a lot of opportunity here and all of the infrastructure comes along you've got the standardized orchestration you've got the standardized virtualization environment everything becomes dynamic if you have 20 different teleports how many hours do i need before i can bring up a new gateway at another teleport i can do that terrestrially i can get a full ericsson stack up in under an hour but i can't do the equivalent on satcom i think in five years there's no reason why you can't so i think we're we're getting there the radio access network goes goes virtual even for us that's uh that's a heck of a vision kim thank you chris uh you uh, again, said some nice things about your company but uh, what's your can you tell us about a typical automation or orchestration project from your point of view sure yeah and i appreciate that uh that that had there it's um we're, we're actually obviously very very close to a number of the aspects relative to uh you know the things that the themes that both will and get covered in terms of virtualization and part of that i think is obviously uh the, the digital if right so a big piece of this is um a lot of the pieces will mentioned are hard to orchestrate uh, because they're physical layer attributes the radios the rf uh those things and if we take the vision that Gint sort of painted um one of the things we have to do is figure out how do we get to that five-year vision he just you know challenged us with uh, and part of that is we have to now start to move the the, the components that are analog in the infrastructure, move those to um, a digital front so that we can then start to move those services around that edge uh, virtualization aspect. So we've been spending a lot of time um, in the uh, EM and NC uh, section, really, of our work to uh, first sorry, lay just, a really- Chris, I'm sorry, just give us EM and, EM and C. What are you- I'm sorry, uh, the element management and control um, element aspect. Element management and control, okay. So, you know, the ability for us to then start to understand the pieces that can be automated in the physical layer, the, the physical functions that, you know, were described um, and figure out then how do we start to map those towards uh, a place where we can automate the movement of, for example, IF uh, uh, L-band frequencies. How do we move those across now, not a uh, analog switch, but actually a digital and, and particularly in this case, an IP environment so then we can start to automate how do i route things uh how do i get to the 
the the visions that both Will and and Gent mentioned. How do I do uh, quick time uh, time to revenue, right? So so not only do we want to offer a quality service, customers want services faster and faster turned up. So really being able to automate from that edge uh, in the element management component of the teleport, start to move those components to digital. Um, and then I think layering on some of the other aspects of virtualization, they, they come naturally as a part of, well, now that I have these components that I can move around, how can I then start to stack those components into virtualization, which, you know, to the points I think both have made, uh, there's a tremendous innovation and, and investment going on in software in 5G. We have a lot to learn from that. And I'm not saying, you know, we strictly adopt 5G, though I think that's also a challenge the industry has to take. I'm saying we can learn a lot from the investment and the initiatives going on in that space to 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 take automation and and, uh, and orchestration into practice. Um, so uh, you know our our focus has been digital IF and virtualization uh, of those components. Uh, and again, I think you know Will's point. Um, there are a lot of physical functions out there. Um, they're not going to go away anytime soon. We have investments in them that are that are you know already made from a capital perspective. Uh, we have to include those in the in the discussion. And for us, uh, and, and again, sort of mentioned it a little bit, standards drive a lot of how I can bring those devices in. So whether or not I can make adapters that take a, a legacy physical function and represent it virtually or control it through an orchestration or automation framework, I, I don't make that distinction necessarily. And I think we should uh, you know, drive to, to support the entire infrastructure that way. Well, Kratos was a principal driver of, of of this new standard, the Diffie, the Diffie standard. Do you want to just talk about that briefly? I mean, what, that's got a very s simple idea behind it, as, as I understand it. Yeah, so it's not actually a new standard. It's been an established standard through the Vita 49 uh, forum for quite a while. I think what, what Kratos has done with Diffie is actually put a working group around that as a consortium to drive Vita 49 as a standard into the various aspects of um, and, and look, I think it is it is SACCOM because we spend a lot of time in our in our space, whether it's SACCOM, whether it's Earth Observation, whether it's you know other components of, of RF. Uh, for us, um, what we're trying to say is the time has come to achieve the visions I think that get painted, the ones that Will are asking for, you know, being a customer, how do I start to automate those things? What we're saying is more people need to be aware that digital IF is is fully uh, you know, it's fully capable of driving the things that we need to do. It actually, um, you know, creates some new opportunities for us in terms of uh, being able to do different types of styles of monitoring. Uh, it now starts to create different architectures where we can separate baseband processing from uplink. Um, so, you know, for us, it's really more about establishing a core consortium of, co of co companies and customers who can uh, take advantage of that. And I think, again, it's about driving a standardization across the satellite industry and not having a splintered approach. And, and we saw that to an extent with some of the um, previous SATCOM standards. There was uh, different adoptions, uh, different, I would call it depth of adoption of standards. What we're trying to say is the standard is complete. We should adopt it completely. Uh, and, <laughs> that's and we're, that's well put. Yeah, and I think we're, re we're really just saying we, we would like a bigger consortium. It, you know, it's, it's one thing for Kratos to say B to 49 is cool. It's a whole other thing for the Department of Defense divisions for Microsoft for other you know components to really put their weight behind it. So, um, and we know there are other folks in the industry talking about digital um, standards for satellite. We, we would like to have everybody participating together, uh, but we'll do it in the best way we can. And I think Diffie's a good step forward. One of the things I thought about. Robert, on this, yes, please. Is it okay if I kind of pull on that thread a little bit with my Chris? Yeah. So, you know, we, we've had this topic come up a couple of times of the LTE standards or the 5G standards. And every time we've, we've broached it with our customers to spur awareness here that the struggle that we have is there's no way to guarantee a CIR value to them. And if in our industry, people are so used to a guaranteed CIR value that I think part of the adoption of those standards is bringing the customers along with that journey as they go through it. As these LEOs come online and you start to see maybe a change in structure on how that, that functions, we may start to be able to move that industry over into a non-guaranteed CIR model and maybe into a gigabit model like what we see in the, in the terrestrial based application. So I think it's not just about the vendors, right? It's also about the customers at the end of the day and what they're willing to accept. And then another point on GINS where you're talking about virtualizing the teleport a bit more, I think I would challenge that too and say, do we virtualize the teleport 
or do we backhaul the teleport to a pop where everything's virtualized at the pop as well? Right, where that actual infrastructure goes into place, I think, is still yet to be decided. And I think it's also part of the fate of what teleports decide they want for themselves. In many cases, especially in, in uh, Earth observation, you see them moving that edge to the teleports to be able to process data and move it as quickly as possible wherever it is they need to go. But when you look at some other systems, they're not doing exactly the same thing. Some customers want it different ways. So I don't know that it's as clear as cut and dry as the virtualization goes into our teleports or virtualization will be a key piece of what it is. And whether it's at the teleport or the closest pop, I think that decision has yet to happen. And maybe Chris or, or Gent, you guys have some thoughts on that. If we have 100,000 teleports across the world, I know I'm getting crazy here. <laughs> no, um, no, we're, we're all for that at WGA. It's, it's you know, when, when you have 4,000 satellites or 12,000 satellites in LEO, and we finally decide to mesh all the networks together, right? And that you can arbitrarily mesh up or down or across. Um, we see the foreshadowing of this capability coming in, coming with integrated access back, back all. This is a 3GPP version 18, I think, is going to add mobility to integrated access and backhaul. But you'll notice that um, companies like Starlink and others are recruiting people that have IAB background. So sorry, just IAB just, just just to find that for us, IAB background. Integrated access and backhaul. So imagine, you know, the first thing we do when we when we build a mobile network, we might have a chain of let's say microwave shots. Why should we build a microwave backhaul when we might have a series of three cell sites adjacent to each other? And when we need a path going through adjacent cell sites, one of those cell sites could be a donor of capacity to backhaul. Now, remember, when you're an antenna and you go east or west, you could have spectrum coming in this spectrum in the uplink direction. And then on the other side of the antenna in the downlink direction, you're reusing, you're doing spatial reuse of that. So IAB is interesting because there's a whole bunch of really powerful optimizations on how you can reuse spectrum and get the job done of backhaul. So now I have all of these sites that have RF and they can dynamically configure themselves into a path and get us back into the core of the network. So extend that up into a mesh up in the sky as well. Um, integrated access and backhaul is an interesting piece of technology. When you give it mobility, it means that that base station can move. Now, all of a sudden, we can put it in satellite. So I'm getting suspicious that um, companies like Starlink are hiring people with IAB background working on the mobility features, and they're going to add whatever other algorithms and technology and control plane capabilities to build a full mesh 12,000 satellite network in the sky. And then what happens after that is, well, it's 3GPP, how do we interwork multiple networks? So I think if we look really far out, we're gonna see all of these LEO and MEO constellations building huge capability, great alternate paths to support applications like high frequency trading and low latency business applications and fiber in the sky, um, bypassing a lot of untrustworthy terrestrial infrastructure and taking you from the middle of nowhere and dropping you straight off inside of your cloud or your edge or wherever you want to be. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there's, there's, uh, there's an awful lot that's kind of coming together and uh, we need to step back and kind of digest it. But back to my point, when this unfolds, all of a sudden, what's a teleport? it could be that American Tower starts pointing their antennas up in the sky. What happens when American Tower points their antennas in the sky because 
they have a they have a series of customers that need to jump from the Midwest to a stock exchange in New York or something else. And all of a sudden the sky is a much better route. So that teleport question gets interesting. If there's a need for more teleports, then going back to my point, the teleport becomes a really important place for basic edge infrastructure. And you see this is the tower companies, you definitely see the edge play that they're doing. So I see the teleports becoming similar to the tower companies, because that's what they are, but a special kind of um, tower company that focuses on having the assets, the bigger antennas and the other assets that are more unique to working with satellite. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I just want to. Right. I just want to call that out for a second because <clears throat> you just said something I think is really worthwhile. You know, as, as our as our industry undergoes these massive, well, there are accelerating changes in technology and leading to you know business model changes. Um, it's really important to look at other industries that, that have done things right. And I think I, you know the mobile industry is obviously good, but it's so far advanced it's not necessarily helpful. But the tower business. There you've got a pretty interesting model for teleport operations because it's, it's you know it's about geography, and it's about a specialized high quality you know facility. So uh, just, I just wanted to make not, sure that people heard that. It's not just that those things too, right? You got to think about licensing, regulatory, what's actually capable. If you've got these cellular antennas that are there and how they'll interfere with satellite antennas, again, spot on, right? When you look at you know how Leos affect the market in the long term and how they drive automation and what a teleport can or would look like in the future. I think, I think he's, he's exactly spot on. But I think the other thing to consider, and it goes back to that orchestration question, is, is there's not going to be the only thing in the sky, right? Leo's one piece of it, Mio's another, Geo will still be there, Broadcast will still use Geo, at least for the foreseeable future as far as we can go. And I think it brings us back into how does orchestration, and I think your next question, if I'm not mistaken, Robert, is how do we bring value in the market when we look at these things? Tiz, by the way, I have a question for you from our from our listeners, however, just quickly. Um, you talked about places other than the edge, sorry, places, you talked about separating the teleport and the, uh, the pop, if you will, as locations for that edge technology. Um, and so, you know, can you just expand on that a little bit to explain how you do that disintermediation? Um, can, you, can you ask the question again? I'm trying to read it here too. You mentioned other places for the edge that well, there was other you, than you, the teleport. Which places are you thinking yeah. of? So, um, you threw out the idea that we may not necessarily be locating all our, or the equipment of, that makes up the edge at the teleport. We may have options to put it elsewhere as well. Yeah, 100%. So, to give an example, our teleport in Miami we may back call the information to the NAP of Americas, right? Uh, or to the Amazon or uh, AWS, obviously Google, Azure, I mean, pick a provider of cloud, we're tied into all of them, right? And our customers have their own hosted systems within those particular cloud environments. So the ability to tie into, tie into those clouds and allow them to enable those cloud environments is really what I'm referring to. There are other things that we've seen as well, where instead of, doing the processing, even the modem processing at the teleport, back all it back to a data center, right? Try to get into a software defined virtualized style of world. And then it takes even more infrastructure away from the teleport and you become an antenna provider, digitalize the IFL, get it back to a pop of some kind or a cloud service provider and then process the information at that location. It really depends on what that model wants to look like at the end of the day. I think again, you said it right. If we're a tower provider, my understanding of the towers, at least, there's not a significant amount of processing, right? They bring in the information, no. they have the radios, they have all the control, and then they backhaul it to the internet, and that's where everything happens after you get to your internet connection. So that, that's, what that's we, not where correct. Yeah, I, I would I would tell you the trend is the trend is to the tower. That. Yeah, it's definitely towards processing um, at the tower site, right? And so if you look at these guys, they're vertical real estate agents. They're saying, hey, if I'm providing you all this infrastructure, well, I can provide you some compute as well. And so I, there's this concept of the fog, right, where the, it's the cloud mm -hmm. on the ground, right, at, at that point. And um, that's not a new concept that's been coined before. But, um, you know, that's specifically, I think, the, the trend that we're seeing. And that's the danger. You know, Gint, Gint actually hit it right on the head. As soon as that antenna gets tilted up to the sky, those guys are in a really interesting position. And I would say to the WTA membership, you can do the same thing. You're already pointed to the sky. 
so this is the point that Git was making about the edge. Bring bring that process to the edge. Redefine what the teleport looks like. You have to make some very specific choices about what your investments look like. But again, I think those are along the lines of the things we've already discussed. There's not anything dramatically unknown about that. You know, these are service off, service automation projects, service orchestration projects, and and edge. You know, whether that's integrating with the cloud partner you already have, or whether that's bringing their technology to your edge teleport, they start to feel the same. And I didn't mean to jump on that, Will, but I I, I want to make clear. No, it's <laughs> exactly right because from our side, what we've seen is the available rack space, HPAC, UPS, things like that, you know, the availability of that infrastructure by moving it to the edge, especially like at a tower where you have a much less footprint for the actual hardware to go. We've seen a debate between our customers of do you do that and put it at a teleport where it's a similar environment or you do at a, at a, you know, a dedicated style of facility to it. And I, I don't know towers well enough, so I'm glad you corrected me on it. I appreciate it. Satellite guy, I guess. But it's it's nice to see that there's a, there's a mix of both, right? Because I think it depends on the application, right? So I, I think there's a really interesting business that teleports can support or become actively involved with. And you know, I, I suggest again looking at what tower companies are doing to build a heavier weight edge. But the big one that's begging is to distribute content. If you have an edge you can cache content. Now, software updates, the Android update, the iPhone 13 up, all this stuff, you wouldn't believe every day how much bandwidth is chewed up terrestrially doing the software updates. Um, so, you know, there's an equation there to, to play with everybody in the ecosystem to change how much those resources, valuable resources on the ground get used. And all of a sudden, you may not need to have fiber everywhere and, and, and so forth, and you can really um, service, for example, private networking and industrial applications a lot better. But you know, one use case is always distributing content to the teleport. And when a teleport is in a sweet spot between satellite assets and certain types of ground demand, it becomes really interesting to say, what role do the teleports have in getting involved with the infrastructure of content distribution? There could be a really interesting play there. I know it's way early, so I'm putting these wacky ideas out there. But no, I, I think you know, I think it, you're exactly right. I mean, if you look at the the innovation and investment going into those, right? Um, I, I don't want to be a doomsayer on the on the teleport investment because I think what we want to say is no, there's a huge opportunity there um, for the teleport investors and the owners to make, and they have to decide. I think you know, giving them a little peek of where we think orchestration will ultimately drive that. Is is I think you know a good value we provide here in this panel is to say like we we do think there's a change coming. It is being driven. You have to sort of decide now and place some bets on these projects that you're going to do. How they're going to enable you to to interact with these these opportunities. So I, I think that actually dovetails into what we're saying. It's not you know uh, a dim view. I think it's actually a really positive view. Chris, you raised a point that I wanted to I wanted to just throw into this conversation. We're running low on time, which means we're having a great conversation. Um, you know, I sort of think back to when you teleport investment, well, it's a half a million dollars in this antenna, and I've got to buy a bunch of boxes, and that's, you know, it's a very capital intensive business. We're talking about a very different set of investments facing this industry. Um, and a lot of them are about building software, building virtualization of things within their facilities. Can you just talk a moment about it? I mean, that seems to me like a very different model that that is going to challenge the skill sets of many um, teleport operators who are, you know, grown up in a slightly, in a somewhat different world. Yeah, I, I do think, um, you know, as we move to virtualization, and certainly, I mean, Will touched a little bit about, you know, where do you do where do you do demodulation and modulation? Do you move that to the edge? Do you move that to the core? I think different use cases are going to move that to different places. Um, for example, in SACOM, there may be a move to, to move some packet processing closer to the actual packet core and some of the places that Gintz talked about. I think for Earth observation, you know, downlinking uh, and demodulation at the edge, actually edge processing and, and reducing the amount of traffic that we're sending forward um, into, the, into the processing, into the public clouds, um, 
does warrant that we have to think about where that position is. So what that means is now I have to have technicians at the edge who are not just skilled in configuring that legacy box with a craft interface. And now I'm really dating myself, but like now I have to go to, uh, you know, API and integration automation. Now you're talking about guys who have to understand uh, what we call edge NFVI or, or network function virtualization infrastructure. So these are cloud servers, edge servers, hyperconvergence. Um, so if you're going to make an investment to get to the things that we've talked about in the last you know 10 minutes, um, you need to now deploy an edge at the side. So whether that is um, IT engineers who are remotely controlling assets at a teleport or whether that's new teleport uh, personnel who understand, you know, the, the, the version of a remote hand today and the, revert, the, the version of a remote hands in the future are likely to be very different skill sets. So I think it's also something and we talked a little bit about this in the report is to to upskilling. Uh, you know, those staff members who, who are going to be on this journey, you know, bringing them to a different kind of, of skill set. Um, and I think that's also an opportunity for those, those folks, right, is for them to take on new skill sets and learn new opportunities. Um, and certainly we've seen that with the movement around uh, digital IF. You know, there's a, there's a pretty big jump in mindset to move from an analog RF uh, design engineer to someone who's then working with some of the digital side. So, you know, we're seeing that already, and certainly with virtualization, um, just just simply in 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 the uh, demodulation for what we're doing with Earth observation as an example. Now I have to be cloud aware because I think somebody mentioned you know Microsoft Orbital. Uh, Microsoft Orbital is doing uh, software demodulation in certain parts of their network and moving that into their their core very efficiently, and that's you know what the customers are asking for. Um, so I do think there's a pretty pretty good shift in investment in personnel as well. Just, uh, I, we've, we're, we're getting down to our last 10 minutes, and I'm going to try to squeeze two questions in here. One is the, a question from our audience, from a skeptic. We have a skeptic in our audience, no surprise. And I'm going to read this because I think it's pretty, it's pretty specific. Is digitizing RF and transporting it over IP networks really compatible with the latency and jitter that we need? And for TDM-based VSAT networks where accelerators, TCP accelerators, are already running at their limits. Is this really going to work? I, 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 want to, I want to jump on that one quickly. Um, so this is not historically. This is not for IP to do. This is something that needs to be done at layer two or layer one, where you have guaranteed QoS. Now, IP is getting progressively more and more traffic engineered, but you, you need a traffic engineered network that can main, even maintain sync and maintain clock. And that's, that's where carrier ethernet comes in. Um, that's fundamental to SCS's architecture. And this is a big piece of work we're doing with Microsoft Azure is to get carrier grade capabilities and transport built into the Azure cloud networking services. And, and you see Microsoft is going there with with Azure for operators. Um, so yeah, I totally hear the question and I agree with the point of view. I'm no. But, I fortunately, but fortunately, I'm sorry, but fortunately there are there's a, there's a solution, which is really good news. And it's I want to thank you for enlightening me about that because uh, I've actually wondered the same thing. I'm sorry, because I just want to give everybody a chance to respond to this last question, which is uh, we've already talked about some of the market and technology shifts going on, but just let's let's polish up the crystal ball, let's look forward five years and say what's going on in the NOC and the rest of that ground infrastructure and a successful teleport operation five years from now. And again, why don't we start with you? Um, so I'm kind of used to running a five plus billion dollar network, you know, five, five billion in revenue with around 10 to 20 people per shift in the NOC. Um, but that's for a different kind of service, right? So highly automated. Um, I don't, I don't wanna put names out there, but the, cl the cloud operators, they have 10 to 15 people per shift to take care of billions in revenue. So that's telling us we have to do something different. We're not going to get there, but we got to get we've got to get onto that curve and go as far as we can. Otherwise, 
they're going to come and take over they're going to come and take over the parts that suit them and then we'll be left with the most undesirable parts yeah, so thank you that's a very very uh, cogent and i think appropriate message um chris no i i think well that, i mean that's a a pretty big spike right in the street right there um i think you know there, there's a journey and, and you can kind of point it out we got to get on that curve and i think so part of it is how do we drive um, the automation and, and orchestration projects to drive the value for our customers today give give those customers a ramp to those places um you know we have to be respectful that the knock does a lot of things they're managing satellite assets they're managing ground infrastructure assets they're managing um connectivity to the clouds or to the backhauls tail circuits they're managing slas right so i think there's a there's an opportunity i think for automation uh, information analytics stats pooling you know there's there's a whole bunch of things we can do to help those folks do the things um but again, I think even Will, you know, in some of our discussions leading up to this has talked about, you know, carrier monitoring as a way to be proactive on, um, you know, various elements of SLA management. So I think it has to be, it's going to turn from managing the infrastructure to managing the service. And part of managing the service is managing the customer and, and their expectations. So I think, um, to me, the knock is going to be much more service aware than, than element aware. And the elements are going to be automated to Gint's point, right, because there's so many of them. Um, and, and I think that's not a terrible shift from where we are. There's a lot of people, in, including you know folks on this call, that are running their business that way. Um, but I think the satellite industry has to get more to an end-to-end -end service awareness. And again, I think an interface with telco is going to drive that as well, because the telcos are going to demand it, yeah. um, especially when we start doing things like carrier Ethernet and and uh, and handoff to intermediate networks. I mean, the, the carriers already have established processes and, and expectations and time frames. So. I think again that knock is going to be more focused on how do I deal with network to network interfaces, service end to end, et cetera. Thank you, Will. I don't, I don't know that I could add much more to what these two have said. I think they're they're spot on. You know, five years from now, if the knock's not automated, it's not going to exist, right? Things have to happen. They have to happen quickly. And at the end of the day, maybe you're tweaking the parameters on which the orchestration works, but it's got to be working at that point. Or I think as Ken said, customers will do it. Yeah, I think in five years from now, we're going to be talking about, about uh, what the elements are of satellite that remain unique as opposed to terrestrial telecom. And, and it's going to be a lot shorter list than we would make right now, would be my guess. Well, then that so would I be progress. Thank, we're already sorry, in, I said that would be progress because we're already sort of considered a niche of certain niches. And so if we're, we're talking like that, that's progress. Well, that's what we got to do next. So I want to thank very, very much Gint Atkinson, Chris Boyd, and Will Mudge for sharing their insights. There's a lot more to this conversation. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we may cycle back and come around and get, get keep this conversation going. But in the meantime, we have to bring this webinar to a close. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I suggest you take out a moment to fill out our online survey after the webinar because that feedback does help us make the next one just a bit better. Uh, you can also download our report, Service Automation and Orchestration for Teleport Operators, from our website, worldteleport.org. Uh, it is free to WCA members and for sale to non-members. Coming up on October 7th, we'll be doing a session at the Satellite Innovation Show 2021 in Mountain View, California, on comparing what uh, is going to happen terrestrial hardware between leo when leo is uh, more than a beta thing but is actually in operation everywhere versus the traditional hts and geo market coming out in terms of our reports in november we'll be publishing how to profit from the customer's digital transformation and it's very relevant to this conversation our, our customers are going to lead us into this world the question is we have to make sure that we understand how to profit from it and how to deliver what our customers need and then finally, in December, we'll drill down a little bit in building a better knock. And you can bet that we'll be talking about some of the things that we talked about today. So again, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, it's been very instructive, at least for me. I always enjoy these sessions. And we we'll look forward to having you join us for our next webinar. This is Robert Bell for World Teleport Association. Mm -hmm.